the love of ten men was a huge loss. Ten potential leaders of the Irish struggle. But their loss was not in vain. They were young men. They left families behind. They left friends behind. But they also left behind a legacy which proved throughout the world what the struggle in Ireland was all about. That it wasn't a struggle of religion. That it, the people who were in jail would never have been there apart from the British occupation in Ireland and that their work was work as freedom fighters. The ten men would die on hunger strength is unimaginable. <clears throat> and I don't think it's possible even to convey to anyone because I don't even know if I can understand it myself. See, if we, if we are going to do something as a group, whatever it is, even if it's sport or we're for a bit of crack or, you know, our politics are going to war, we can plan it. We can appoint leaders, we can train, we can get resources. But if you're on hunger strike, you're on your own. You can't be ordered, instructed, compelled, trained. You can't, none of those things can happen. So how, how could this, only 20 years ago, and I reckon that it will all seem like yesterday. I reckon up onto the day that I die, it will seem to me as if it was just yesterday that these hunger strikes happened. And that must be because of the, the, the imprint they made upon us. When huge events happen, that they have such an imprint on, on our consciousness. Another prong was around criminalization, a huge propaganda effort to present the disturbances or the troubles or the struggle, not as anything that's politically motivated or worthy, but something which is criminal, terrorist. The, the terms used were Chicagoism, acts of Chicagoism. Godfathers became a well-known insult. It's worth remembering also that the governments here in Dublin colluded in that lie. Included in the land that it wasn't about justice, it wasn't about equality, it wasn't about freedom, it wasn't about Irish unity, it wasn't about any of those things at all. It's about some little sort of criminal conspiracy, the sort of business you get here in Dublin uh, around drugs and the, the criminal gangs, and this is what the North was about. And part of that, and this was the third prong, was to remove from the prisoners, the political prisoners, their status. So that in March 1976, people who were in prison after that point ceased to have any sort of political prison. Now nobody planned any response to that. <coughs> a guy called Kieran Nugent was given a prison uniform and he said, if you want me to wear that, you're going to have to nail it to my back. And of course other people joined him. The same thing happened in the women's prison. So that within a relatively short time, the hit block conveyor belt had scooped up hundreds, hundreds, mostly of young men and some young women. And because they wouldn't wear the prison uniform, they were naked. They wore blankets. For, at the beginning, incidentally, they weren't even given a blanket. At the beginning, they were totally naked. And the blankets were taken out in the morning and brought back at late Saturday night. They were then lost privilege. It's a lovely, lovely phrase. There's, there's, a, there's a, a regulation in the Prison Act for the, for the, uh, the treatment of the management of the prisoners. And it's GOD 47. That's what it's called. God 47. And all privileges can be taken away. So they weren't allowed anything to read, weren't allowed videos, magazines, any recreation or intellectual stimulation. And as the protest went on, they weren't allowed to go out of the cell to empty their holes, to empty their chamber pots, or to wash. And even that became a spontaneous protest. 
that, that someone, when the screw slammed the door of his face, someone threw the, the piss pot out and the thing escalated from there. So that you get to a point that around 1980, about four to five hundred prisoners had suffered this for five years. Now, <coughs> some of the older prisoners cast about looking for some way to break that cycle, to stop it, to bring it to a head. Because they saw, they saw young people coming in and being subjected to all sorts of indignities. When, when, when you talk about you know, a prisoner being forcibly washed, it actually means being forcibly washed. It means being hosed down. It means being scrubbed with dax scrubbers. It means having a disinfectant uh, hosed over you. When you hear about a prisoner being strip searched, it means strip searched. A bull search, plastic gloves up the back passage, spread out, lie down, all that stuff. And the desire of some of the older men to break the cycle was about just stopping all of that. And the five demands, and I've always thought this, I thought it was a time when I still think it today, the five demands were the way out for the British. Five demands were very reasonable, just it was a very modest, I suppose, minimum that you require for some sense of human dignity. But I think the biggest, the biggest lesson of the hunger strikes has to be for Republicans. And if you could imagine anyone who would have justification for being vindictive or spiteful or resentful, Bobby Sands had all the reasons for that. Can't he have reason to vent his spleen in a strident way? Bobby Sands wrote about the issue of revenge. And he wrote, that our revenge be the laughter of our children. Why well, I think that the peace process, the need for popular support, the need to try and shape a struggle so that people own it, the need for politics to be about empowering people, the need for it to be about the future, and what we have tried to do to contribute to that is also a legacy of the hunger strike. And I think we could do worse than to keep that little phrase as the prize, to keep our eye on that prize, to have an Ireland in which people will be liberated, that unions and the rest of us can live in harmony, and that Irish children can laugh and not be subjected to all the different indignities and great griefs and grievances that the public of them.
On behalf of the Dublin 81 Committee, a broad-based committee which was brought together some months ago to commemorate and celebrate all that had been achieved by the 1981 hunger strikers, I'd like to welcome everybody here today. This is a very special occasion, a very historic occasion, and it's not just to commemorate Bobby Sands, even though we think of him and people throughout the world think of him as one of the most important Irish leaders of, of all time, but to commemorate all of those who have died on hunger strike on behalf of Ireland. This will be an occasion not of speeches, so I won't say much more. It will be a commemoration of the lives of those men who had such a horrible death at the hands of Maggie Thatcher and the British government. We are here to show that we will never forget them, that we will never forget their sacrifice on our behalf and on behalf of the generations of Irish people who will follow us. strike happened to be the ten young supreme young men. The young men who loved Ireland dearer than anyone in Leinster House ever or could ever love Ireland dearer. And when Leinster House was asked to when Leinster House was asked to intervene, Hahi was asked, he said I can do nothing about it the hypocrite, but thank God that his name is amongst the rogues that there is in the near and quarry at the present day. And we had Bobby Sands, we had Francis Hughes, and we had Ray McCreesh. We had Patsy O'Hara and John McDonnell. We had Martin Horson, we had Kevin Lynch and Kieran Doherty. We had Thomas McLeary, we had Mickey Devine. The Irish mind has only known one definition. It is a definition of freedom. Not a geographical definition of freedom. Not a freedom for a creed. Not a freedom for a class. Not a freedom for a section. But a freedom for all. They have cherished that freedom more than wealth, more than happiness, and more than sickness. And your 22 hunger strikers cherish that freedom with their lives. And when I thought of Bobby Sands, Two things occurred to me. First of all, there was Apollo, the great Greek god of love, who went down among the swine herds. He became a swine herd himself in order to propagate the gospel of love among mankind. And the other was, he who was born in Bethlehem, who was born in a stable, and had himself crucified so that he could spread the message of love along the spirit's cable. Thinking of Apollo, who went down among the swine herds, and of others, and of, and of Jesus, who elected to be born in a stable. I thought of those in Belfast who traced excrement on their cell walls to send the world a message along the spirit's cable. Then the final throw, the refusal of food to the body, the minds roaring along swerved avenues of agony. Bishop Shanghai to tell them their souls were in danger as the English discovered the value of Catholic theology. That they should let you die rather than wear your own jacket. To find the jackboot under that affable decorum. Let it not be forgotten that that summer, the Tagues in Belfast 
out of their body's agony, may the world, their forum. The Rhythm of Time by Bobby Sands. There's an inner thing in every man. Do you know this thing, my friend? It has withstood the blows of a million years and will do so until the end. It was born when time did not exist and it grew up out of life. It cut down evil strangling vines like a slashing shearing knife. It lit fires when fires were not and burnt the mind of man, tempering leaden hearts to steel from the time that time began. It wept by the waters of Babylon, and when all men were a loss, it screeched in writhing agony, and it hung bleeding from the cross. It died in Rome by line and sword, and in defiant cruel array, when the deathly word was Spartacus along the Appian Way. It marched with what the Tyler's poor and frightened lord and king and it was emblazoned in their deathly stare as air living thing. It smiled in holy innocence before conquistadors of old, so meek and tame and unaware of the deathly power of gold. It burst forth through pitiful Paris streets and stormed the old Bastille and marched upon the serpent's head and crushed it neat its heel. It died in blood on buffalo plains and starved by moons of rain. Its heart was buried at wounded knee, but will come to rise again. It screamed aloud by Kerry Lakes as it was knelt upon the ground, and it died in great defiance as they coldly shut it down. It is the sound in every light of hope. It knows no bounds nor space. It has risen in red and black and white. It is there in every race. It lies in the hearts of heroes dead. It screams in tyrants' eyes. It has reached the peak of mountains high. It comes searing across the skies. It lights the dark of this prison cell. It thunders forth its might. It is the undauntable thought, my friend, that thought that says I'm right. Sunday, 1st March, 1981. I'm standing on the threshold of another trembling world. May God have mercy on my soul. My heart is very sore because I know that I've broken my heart, my poor mother's heart, and my home is struck with unbearable anxiety. But I considered all arguments and tried every means to avoid what has become the un unavoidable. It has been forced upon me and my comrades by three and a half years of stark inhumanity. I am a political prisoner. I am a political prisoner because I am a casualty of a perennial war that is being fought between the oppressed Irish people and an alien, oppressive, unwanted regime that refuses to withdraw from our land. I believe and stand by the God-given right of the Irish nation to sovereign independence and the right of any Irish man or woman to assert this right in armed revolution. That is why I am incarcerated, naked and tortured. Foremost in my tortured mind is the thought that there can never be peace in Ireland until the foreign oppressive British presence is removed, leaving all the Irish people as a unit to control their own affairs and determine their own destinies as a sovereign people, free in mind and body, separate and distinct, physically, culturally and economically. I believe that I am but another of those wretched Irish men born of a risen generation with a deeply rooted and unquenchable desire for freedom. I am dying not just to attempt to end the barbarity of H-Block or to gain the rightful recognition of a political prisoner, but primarily, primarily because what is lost for the Republic and those wretched oppressed whom I am deeply proud to know as the risen people. To make sweet of a new her in Cale Con Show. Darren Dini, a long fee and corp. A knee queer and winning, so corp her big. Yasum card, color, good size trudder. Her do sneak lock and lesh and corp and ask the beer. If young mean shay on cahoo beer. His grey hair aura, ella a vein and sheer clip all and curb. Trudden and corp a rash car color. A dera and lay, chain ock and road a rash with him free brother. Is a shin and vower. Is a on vower and road is talking. Mother will vower, lie that con coronai the ock and road in morphine. Never gain spread through the agot. Is on shame, cane eyed as a digging a meower cart show. Vader as a fair on searcher. Near he came to gurvey and eye to dig and shame. Mother will cheat an eva and fair on searcher shisha. Never cheat an eva to fain of rishe. He wish for sheet may, mer may, mer ta fell on searche, of a searche wind in a hair and immocrane. 
Chokila Egan, or a vegan found Searsha, let his bond, a Dini Galerna Heron, or a chief from Weed, Irene Gala. I heard a laugh upon this bright May morning, fill up the sky as if his heart would break. I thought of you that hour when you lay dying, and how you long to hear that lark We've heard an awful lot about mandates, but those who came out in Fermanagh South Tyrone and elected Bobby Sands, the over 30,000 people who came out and elected Bobby Sands an MP, and probably one of the, if not the largest funeral ever in Ireland, the 100,000 people in a very momentous and very moving occasion who walked behind Bobby Sands' coffin, proved to Maggie Thatcher and proved to the whole world that these men were not criminals, but freedom fighters.
political prisoner. He said, they have branded me as a criminal. Even though I die, I die in a good cause. When Terence McSweeney TD, mayor of Cork, died on hunger strike in 1920, the placard on the door of Cork City Hall declared, Terence McSweeney murdered by the foreign enemy in the fourth year of the Republic. <laughs> and after the 10 men died on hunger strike in 1981, the Republican prisoners in Hainsbrooks, as they announced the end of the protests, told the world, our comrades have lived with their very lives an eternal beacon which will inspire this nation and crush oppression forever. The role of honour is Tomás Ash, Mountjoy Jail, 25th September 1917, Michael Fitzgerald, Cork Prison, 17th October 1920, Joseph Murphy, Cork Prison, 25th October 1920. Terence McSweeney, Brixton Prison, October 25th, 1920. Joseph Whitty, Cork Camp, 2nd September 1923. Dennis Barry, Newbridge Camp, 20th November 1923. Andy Sullivan, Mountjoy Jail. 20 years ago this year in the Hicks Brooks of Long Kish. Bobby Sands, Belfast, 5th May. Francis Hughes, County Derry, 12th May. Ray McCreesh, County Armagh, 21st May. Patsy O'Hara, Derry City, 21st May. Joe McDonald, Belfast, 8th July. 